25 year volunteer and educator and advocate for the New York State State part of the International Dark Sky Association. She works with public officials and also educating the public and environmental groups like us. She helped write the municipal orders um, for outdoor lighting codes in her community that address this problem of light pollution. And I just found this out from her, which I think is amazing. She's actually um, a certified lighting designer and she's gonna talk more about that. And I'm also just wanna give a shout out to Susan because this is her first Zoom presentation. And as you can see, it was a little hard at the beginning, but she's on it. And I don't, I think we're all gonna be excited to hear what she has to say. So thumbs up for Susan Harder and take it away. All right, hi everybody. My first Zoom meeting, I hope you can hear me. Well, let me know. Um, okay, so I've got 90 slides. I'm gonna get through them quick because I wanna meet your uh, requirement for 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and Susie did, and thank you Susie for inviting me. Uh, normally I have to get on, you know, get in the car, get on the plane, you know, to go and give these talks. So I'm gonna make the best of it. Um, I don't commercially do the lighting design. I took lighting design so that I'd be able to understand, you know, the parameters. I have had people, you know, electricians and, you know, street lighting people say, oh, we can't do that. I wanted to learn, you know, why or if that's not even true. So um, I don't do it commercially. I have designed lighting for nonprofits um, and I do this work as a volunteer. Okay, so. Everybody wants to know why I got involved. Um, this is my neighbor's light and it was shining into my house. My law in East Hampton, I thought it was pretty clear. You can't see the source of the illumination across property lines, but our law did not have definitions in it. So I worked with our city fathers and we rewrote the lighting law. And most communities have something on the books but it has to be very specific and it has to meet um, what professionals consider to be, uh, you know, dealing with the lighting. So I was told to join the International Dark Sky Association by my neighbor, Davis Sobel, the writer on astronomy. And uh, that was 25 years ago. And I've been working with this organization since. So this is what SkyGo looks like. With this, the light is going up into the sky, sky. instead of aimed directly at the ground. And it hits uh, particulate and moisture in the air, causing the sky glow. This is the comparison of with and without. The Milky Way is, I don't know if you all can see your Milky Way, but only a third of the people in our country can see it right now because of light pollution. And this is what the comet would have looked like with and without. So it's not, for the most part, this type of lighting was not intentional, where it's going way off target. Um, our solution is to use fixtures that put light towards the ground rather than straight out and up into the sky. And you can see that it's, um, you can generally save about a third of the electricity when, the, when you're uh, directing light towards the ground. And we, it, we have problems with light trespass when lighting is not controlled. So we only use the word light pollution, meaning night lighting, it's misdirected, unshielded, excessive or unnecessary. And you can see it as glare, sky glow and resulting air, uh, air pollution. So the consequences, as I just said, were the glare, the light trespass, sky glow. We're wasting money. We're causing tremendous ecological disturbances, which uh, Susie mentioned, and I will too. But it, recently, uh, we've had much more emphasis on the human health aspects of light pollution called LAN, light at night. And of course, we can't really quite measure, but we can feel the sense of uh, a loss of connection to the stars. You, most of you have seen this map. Now, it was taken with satellites and the satellites were actually able to measure the amount of light hitting the satellites. So we know that we're wasting a tremendous amount of money sending light up into the sky. Also, while this is all night, the whole world is in a night and day cycle, which is really important to consider when we talk about humans and plants and animals because 
you know, they half of our lives are at night. So when we talk about dark sky lighting or even dark sky laws, um, we know that we're getting adequate light for safety. We're reducing glare because you can see better when you don't have a bright light source in your face, conserving energy, protecting our health and enhancing the nocturnal environment. And also we're able to see the stars. I advocate for change because the retrofits will often pay for themselves. So when we talk about the dark sky lighting, it's basically common sense. Um, using the shielded fixtures, uh, using light levels that are established by the professionals not to exceed them, and use lighting when it's needed for pedestrian safety and property identification, and then you can shut it off. Um, mounting it at the correct height in relation to the property line. So the closer it is to the property line, the shorter the um, height. And also we really need to reduce the amount of blue that's in our light sources. I'll talk about that. So the estimate is that we're wasting about 30%, resulting in $4.5 billion a year in the United States. Resu you know, coal and um, uh, oil are primarily used to generate electricity at this point. So that results in increased taxes and product prices. So a qu when you leave a 100 watt incandescent light bulb on, dust to dawn, in a year it's gonna burn a quarter of a ton of coal. So roadway lighting is our greatest source of light pollution because we've been using these unshielded light fixtures for such a long time. And here you can see the difference. And this is what it looks like. This is a drop lens, um, which is primarily used, but they've started to convert them to what they now call a fully shielded Cobra head. So if you don't have these in your town, they are available. Um, more information about you know, air pollution. And these are the concerns. So glare is a real problem because unshielded lights send light out. And you can't, I don't know if my arrow shows it, but here on the left is a railroad sign that's obscured by the glare. So what we wanna do is shield that bright light source because it will, you'll have less night vision if you've got glare in your face. And you know how when you come out of a movie theater, back when we used to go to movies, um, you can't see as well. It's because your eyes will ad adapt to the brightest light source. And I don't know if you have these utility pole mounted fixtures, um, but we have been able to, um, our local, in, um, on Long Island, we were able to get them to convert those to this fully shielded fixture. This is what it looks like. So light trespass is you know, how I got interested. And this is a, a senior housing on the left, and this is this gentleman's house across the street. This is a little cartoon that was in our uh, mailer that we sent around in East Hampton. So it doesn't just disrupt your sleep and your immune system, but by interfering with your circadian rhythms, you, it will be suppressing your melatonin. And melatonin is a uh, tumor suppressant. So it's, we're talking about a rise in childhood leukemia suspected of, of, of light at night. This just shows you all the different um, times of day and the different uh, biological functions. So this is considered a higher risk of prostate cancer, um, light at night, and also breast cancer. The conference in 2002 was the first to talk about night lighting as it relates to flora and fauna. This was their poster, which shows all the, imp all the different impacts. So flora and fauna have evolved over hundreds of millions of years in that bright day and the dark night cycle with the moon phase stimulated behaviors. So light pollution disrupts the habitats and behaviors of mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, fishes, invertebrates, and plants. And Travis Longcore was the um, director of that, of that uh, conference. 
All of the things we do for nature preservation are necessary, but they might not be sufficient if we don't address this. And in their, uh, and they also concluded that alerts readers to common diurnal bias. You know, most researchers, it's much easier for them to study animals during the day. It's much more difficult at night. So not that many studies have actually been done about creatures at night. I, I can, I'm not gonna read all this. I'm just gonna tell you the, the different species that they studied. They studied bat species being in fact impacted by light pollution. Sea turtle hatchlings will go towards land that's lit rather than back into the sea when they hatch. Um, frogs, salamanders, snakes, moths, uh, fish have been disturbed by light that falls on the water. Um, songbirds, they've, they've actually done quite a bit of study about songbirds and hundreds of millions of songbirds are, are killed because they run into lit buildings. And then on water, um, when water is lit, the zooplankton doesn't come up at night in order to consume the algae. And trees are affected um, by being lit up all night because they don't go into their dormancy when they're supposed to. And also puffins and petrels. And recently, um, they've been talking about fireflies. Uh, night lighting results in ecological disturbances of individuals and entire species in ways that are being discovered in every study conducted. Every study. Um, this shows you the, um, the traveling of the turtles going towards uh, the light and rather than going into the ocean. There is a law in Florida uh, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife enforces it so that beachfront um, condominiums and houses and streetlights are shielded. This is a poster of um, National Bird Migration Day. It's actually at night. You can see how the stars, and they've been discussing the fact that birds navigate, well, first of all, birds fly at night in order to save energy because um, they're cooler. And also they partially navigate by the stars as have been, whales have been, um, determined that they're also uh, taking cues from the stars. So this is a program up in Toronto where they collect birds that run into lit buildings. And Toronto has actually established a lights out during migration season as on, the, on the big skyscraper uh, wall washing. They call that when they light up the whole building itself, that's called wall washing. So this, this is one here, before and after. And of course, with fireflies, you know, they communicate with each other through their lighting of each other. So they've been impacted by light pollution because they're um, less able to find each other. And here's a tree that's uh, lit up um, all night long. And you can see that the side that's lit is, is not going into dormancy, which causes dieback. Here's the poor lighting design. This is a better lighting design. And for signs, it's better to light it from above, keep the light towards the ground. Here's a, shows you how, this is a before, this is an after. You can actually read the sign better. Um, there's also what they call flagpole top lighting. So we, let's keep in mind, you know, electric lighting is really just an, a new invention in the, in the scheme of things. Um, and we do need it, you know, we use it for, to permit activities, but it does affect us. Um, and also we're increasingly uh, brighter light sources. Uh, you know, candles and flames are less than 200 lumens and we have to get used to calling light um, by lumens and it's on a package. Uh, so you don't wanna convert an incandescent wattage to a uh, compact fluorescent or LEDs. Also light, bulbs produce a false light. Daylight here in the middle on the top is equal proportions. You know when you would have the prism in elementary school and you would break up the light? It's an equal amounts. But light bulbs all have different amounts in different colors. Um, so what we need to pay attention to is the fact that mercury vapor, metal halide, and LEDs have a tremendous amount of blue light. And blue light has been shown to create health problems. Here's an LED, it's much higher in um, 
the blue uh, proportion because it's they're linking it to macular degeneration. Also, you probably have heard that having your um, personal devices uh, to not be looking at them within a couple hours of sleep because it will just it will uh, disturb your sleep thereafter. Um, this is because of the blue light and you can get a blue light filter on your televisions and your computers and your um, cell phones. And we know that, you know, the blue headlights, you know, reduce our visibility. After you pass by someone who's got that bright blue headlight, you don't see as well. It's because it shuts your, 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 your eyeball down um, as a result of the blue light. So we need to avoid blue light as much as possible. So when you go to the store to buy light bulbs, you want to get the ones that are marked 2300 Kelvin, not 5000 Kelvin, not 4000 Kelvin, because that will tell you that the, um, how much blue light is in it. So we wanted 2300, 2700 Kelvin. Um, and of course, with the more blue light comes more sky glow because it, the blue light waves are shorter and they scatter more. So you're going to end up with more sky glow, the more blue. I'm a proponent of reversing um, light pollution. And there's no sacrifice for safety or security, and we can basically pay for itself. We can change the fixtures, the bulbs, the location, adding timers and sensors. Everything will reduce the light pollution and save money. This is a um, diagram, and Susie's going to make this accessible to you through a link. Um, this is what we use. This is actually attached to building permits all around the country. Um, it show on the left hand side would be all the unshielded fixtures and on the right hand side are the new ones and we are getting cooperation from the manufacturers they're re they're changing fixtures and as a result of uh, the efforts that we've been making and the International Dark Sky Association has a page where they show you all the different um, fixtures the problem was that we've got all these old fixtures that were meant for flames and we're sticking these very high wattage bulbs in them. And so here's another one where the bulb is up inside the cap. And a lot of uh, his so-called historic fixtures, which used flames, um, they pick them during the day and then they forget what they might look like at night. And these send a lot of light up and out and you know, less is hitting the ground. The new fixtures have these uh, reflectors inside that um, direct the light in uh, more, uh, completely a much better uh, proportion on the ground. These are so-called historic fixtures that are what we refer to as uh, fully shielded. On the left is an unshielded post top and on the right is a shielded post top, very similar in design. Uh, this, this is on the Via Appia. I took these photographs when I was in, uh, outside of Rome they're shielded. And the, like I said, the manufacturers are starting to get on board with this. They call it good neighbor lighting because it's less trespass into your neighbor's bedroom. Um, there's also a device. We don't need to leave towers lit all night long. Uh, this is a device that lights itself only when um, you, a transponder is within uh, a certain distance. So the guidelines that we've been using for this good lighting, the International Dark Sky Association has a, a wonderful uh, book. The US Green Building Council, the lead um, lighting design, they have a credit for light pollution reduction. And the Illuminating Engineer Society uh, issues practices for exter exterior lighting. And there's also lots of laws on the books. What we need is real security and not bad lighting. A lot of people leave all their lights on thinking it's protecting their house. And what it, 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 the opposite is true. Um, it also, it allows for people to see, you know, if somebody's gonna rob a house and they leave all the outside lights on and there's no inside lights, they can, and there's no cars in the driveway, they can suspect that somebody, nobody's there because most crimes are committed during the day and most crimes are committed on personal property when nobody's there. The, um, the Department of Justice 
was set out to evaluate the relationship between lighting and crime, there is a strong indication that increased lighting only decreases the fear of crime. So it gives you a sense of security, but not real security. And they asked some inmates about property crimes and they said, what were your deterrents? Dog, alarm system, someone at home, security lighting was not even on their list. So light pollution has substantial environmental consequences. If any decision is taken to increase lighting, it needs to be taken on the best possible evidence. That's the British Journal of Criminology. So they also have started dark campus policies around the country. Um, you know, with, that are not open to the public at night. And it does not increase vandalism. And what they have found that they reduced not just the cost of electricity, but vandalism and uh, break, you know, break-ins and, and loitering. You know, was also re and graffiti was reduced in some of these school districts. So even a prison can have good lighting. Uh, this is an ATM lighting. Now there is an ATM lighting law for New York State, but it you do not have to have bad lighting. It, they can have fully shielded lighting and also meet the requirements of that New York State law. Here's a gas station that's got the, those drop lens and they're using 6,400 watts. Here's one with 3,500 watts and it meets all the recommendations for professional light levels. So here's the before and here's an after. Uh, so the causes, unshielded excessive light fixtures, emitting light upward and off the target, light levels that are exceeding the recommendations and the professionals set these light levels, unnecessary or redundant lighting, misaimed fixtures, fixtures incorrectly located, positioned, wrong height, etc. And most importantly, no sensor dimming or shutoff controls to match the need. So our solutions are education, examples, policies, guidelines, regulations, and enforcement. And here in East Hampton, our local code enforcement said that it was the easiest code for them to enforce. They didn't have to repeatedly deal with it like they do for noise uh, ordinances. So we try to encourage people that change has a considerable psychological impact to the fearful it is threatening because it means that things may get worse, to the hopeful it is encouraging because things may get better, to the confident it is inspiring because the challenge exists to make things better. So here's a dark night sky thick with stars. It's almost like a blanket. You feel like it's right on your face when you're lying on a, a, a blanket in uh, Hawaii or you know some beautiful place. And these are, these are my websites, and that's my license plate, in case you see me driving around. Um, and that's my show, so I'm open for questions. Susie? I can't hear you. Susie, I think you're, you're mute. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> yes, phew, I was mute. You were right. Um, let's see. Maybe we'll stop sharing um, your screen and then we can all see each other. Um, so if you want to just go to your share screen. Yeah, there you go. Susan, you're a pro. Well, first of all, wow, that was so fascinating and so informative. <laughs> um, that was just filled with so much great information. And I'm wondering if anybody out in the audience has any questions they would like to ask Susan. And just because it's hard because we can't see people raising their hand, if you want to send it in a chat to Miles or me, or I can actually see Victor, he just raised his hand. Victor, you have a question? Yes, actually I do. Um, so we did touch just a little bit on um, uh, the effect of light on safety. And I wonder if uh, Susan uh, had anything else that she might add to that, because I do remember reading an article once uh, that said that, you know, the, a lot of people uh, feel more safe when they, when they are around more light at night. But the, the research has indicated that that might not actually be the case. And the reason is because light uh, helps you to see, but it also would help a criminal to see. Um, well, you know, people are, afraid of the dark. 
a lot of people are afraid of the dark. Um, unless you get introduced, you know, to the, to the beauty of the nocturnal environment. But lighting is, there are certain light levels that are proven to be adequate for safety. And that's light levels on the ground. It's measured with a uh, light meter. But the thing that helps a sense of safety is no glare. People mm -hmm. do not feel safe in the presence of glare because right. they don't see as well. And we have a tremendous amount of glare by unshielded fixtures all over the world. Um, and it was not done on purpose. It was done um, just because people didn't, you know, didn't think about it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah it does. I, I remember reading something about the glare too. That's a good point. Yeah. Great, great conversation. Lots to think about. Um, and Victor, you're so right. If you can see better, so can somebody else. And that has passed through my mind. Um, there's some great questions out here. Tony wants to know if you can say a little bit more about LED lighting okay. um, in particular. Okay. I, I have a real problem with LED lighting because mm -hmm. LEDs are, not, are, are blue. They're initially blue and they have filters that change the colors. So there's a lot of blue light in LEDs. Even if you've got the same Kelvin, which is a measurement of, of, the, of the, the spectrum of the light bulb, of incandescent and LEDs, LEDs are gonna have more blue. And blue affects the human body in ways that we're just now finding out and it's bad. Um, it has a greater impact on our your eyes. It has a greater impact on our hormones and on our sleep and on so many things. So I just think we need to be super careful with LEDs. Make sure you buy them in the 2300 Kelvin and also to try to avoid LED lighting for in and around your bedroom. Um, it's, they do have red LEDs. Now red light does, um, is a perfect light to use. Um, like for example, if you need a light in your bedroom, use red because it doesn't change your hormones. Um, and you can still see adequately. So um, the LEDs, just be very careful with them. They do ha have a dimming uh, ability with LEDs. So they can be very useful, but they're also very problematic that we're, we're fi just now finding out. Of course, you know, they invented these things and then we find out about the problems afterwards. You know, they're not practicing the precautionary principle of first do no harm. You know, they invent them and then we have to figure out, you know, how to deal with it. Well said, Susan. Here's another great question. And this is a question I had, which is kind of why I, I was excited to have you here. Um, where should we begin? This is from Anne, and she would like to know where should we begin if we want our towns to implement regulations and begin to change what's on the streets and the playgrounds and the gas stations and et cetera. So what's some good tips? Well, the, the, the best, the way that we've approached this elsewhere is find out from your local planning or zoning or legislators or town attorney, what's already on the books? Because it probably needs to do as we had to do in East Hampton, which was to add definitions so that it would be utterly clear, you know, to your planning and zoning and enforcement, how to, you know, approach it. So I would find out what's already there and then I think that um, I can send you another link of when you have the best way to deal with it is new lighting. If new lighting, because when you, your planning department looks at a new commercial site, they get a, a plan. They get a landscape plan, they get the building plan, they get the site plan. You have to ask them for a lighting plan. And you can ask them to specify what you want to see. You want to see the foot candle measurements. You want to see a, a photograph of the light fixture. 
you know, there's certain things you can ask for in order to determine whether or not it's going to be, because after it's built, it's almost too late. Um, unless they're terribly wasteful, and most are, it doesn't pay to get it changed. But I would deal with, first, talk to your planning and see if they ask for anything about lighting. And I will give you what we call guidelines for lighting plans. It's three or four pages and you simply hand it to applicants when they come in to um, apply for a building permit. You give them, you can give them those diagrams, you know, the, the good, good fixtures and the bad fixture diagram. Those can be attached to every building permit that people come in, you know, when they're building a house or a commercial site. Great, thank you, Susan. That's really exciting. And um, it gives a lot of people a place to start. And I do wanna mention that um, tomorrow we'll be sending out in an email to you um, some links that Susan sent us to share with you. And Susan, if you send us that new link, we'll include that in tomorrow's email. So okay. we have a lot of great questions. Here's another one from Leslie. She is wondering how the DOT's regulation on lighting jives with good lighting concepts. And she shares that when she lived in New York City, she noticed lightning bugs disappearing in Central Park. And she was told it was because the DOT required an over, over lighting of walking paths. You know, I, I, I don't even know where to begin with this one. I have tried to beat my head against a wall with the New York City DOT to the point where I had meetings, I made presentations. And finally, the guy who's in charge of New York City DOT lighting, streetlights, finally said, I'm gonna do it the way I do it. And I don't care what you say. So New York, until this guy is no longer <laughs> working for DOT, I think we're kind of stuck with some pretty bad lighting in New York. It's terrible shame because, you know, I've, I've gone to transportation hearings. I've had laws proposed by council people. I even had a councilman say to DOT, how dare you come here and lie to us? So that's kind of a really sad situation, but this is not common. Lots of times I've made phone calls to town DOT people and the guy will say, I'm sorry, it's a guy, We'll say, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Let's, we'll look into these shielded streetlights. And then they start using shielded streetlights. So it's a really mixed bag. But New York City, I'm sorry to say, it, it's not going to work for now. That, that's too bad. Um, if we, most of us probably who are in this um, program tonight ha are, aren't living in New York City right now. Um, and maybe it's a good thing for us to check our own towns on what the DOT plans are and see, see what, um, if we could have, begin to have conversations. So it's a good starting point before we end up in a situation like, you are, like New York City. Uh -huh. Well, if you just ask them to look into using fully shielded streetlights and ask them if they could please look into reducing the blue. So they can use LEDs, they're going to anyway but ask them to reduce the Kelvin. Um, and also, you know, use it to use streetlights where it makes sense. A lot of streetlights have gone up just because the electric companies um, were stringing out new uh, systems for new subdivisions. And the local utility would put up streetlights, which then the municipality would have to pay for and our taxes. Um, and there really was no particular rhyme or reason for putting in these streetlights. They need to be put where there's pedestrians, where there's a, where the cars are parked on the street and, you know, there's people mingling with cars at intersections where people are crossing and, you know, where they're going to do some good. But, you know, there was a guy here in East Hampton who wanted the councilman to put in a streetlight because he was going to start to park his boat on the street and he thought that he would light it up. So, so we just need to use them intelligently. Yeah, great point. Um, here's a great question. I'm curious about this too from Valerie. Um, Valerie's wondering if you could share some of the regulations that your community has in regard to lighting. And this might give us a model to take to our zoning commissions. So well, tell us some successes, some models. Well, well like I said before, 
when, so, when someone comes in for a commercial building permit, you give them a sheet of paper that says, you know, they must be shielded, you must meet and not exceed professional light levels, and give us an idea of, you know, the timing, when you're gonna have them on, when you're gonna have them off. But these are called guidelines for good site plans. Now, the interesting thing is that, let's say a gas station, let's say a new shopping center wants to do lighting. And they say, oh, well, you have to follow our guidelines. Well, you hand them the book, little pamphlet that says what, what, we, what your town requires. It doesn't cost them anything. The manufacturers have lighting designers on staff. They will produce a lighting plan to meet your requirements for free. They do this because they're selling fixtures, you know, to you, you know, to these, to the, but it doesn't cost anything to get a good lighting plan, nothing. And a lot of people don't know this, you know, they go, oh no, I can't, oh, I got to pay all that. No, it doesn't cost anything at all. And I would definitely for homes, um, you could ask that they use fully shielded fixtures. There's no reason not to. So here's a question that is really specific to our community um, from Richet, and I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Um, we have a we have two area ski mountains, and um, it is really, really quite the sight in the winter to see those mountains lit up for night skiing. And I guess we're curious if there, if you know of any regulations or any guidelines for um, ski mountains with regards to outdoor night lighting? Well, no, I don't know about that particular, in, particularly. Um, wow. Because snow reflects so much of the light. That's right. It's yeah. really gotta be, it's really gotta destroy the night sky. It does. I mean, uh, I can just tell you that one time people were saying that they could see the northern lights and I went out to look from where I lived, and I lived near Crotchet Mountain. It, I could all, all I could see was the glow from Crotchet Mountain. Yeah. You know, it's too bad. I know I see people nodding their heads. They, people have noticed this, but maybe we'll check. Maybe we could check with International Dark Sky. Maybe they have some guidelines. Yeah, I've not heard of regulating. I mean, telling them to shut them off when they don't need them is like the basic place to start. It's true, except I'll tell you, um, they need them all the time because uh, they run midnight madness. So the lights are on until you know midnight, and then they're they're making snow and grooming the mountains. So then they're on until three or four in the morning. So basically, in the winter time, it's a real washout for the night sky. That's a shame. It is. It is. Yes, and this is Rache who prompted that. My house actually overlooks. I have a, a straight shot look at Crotchet Mountain, so I get to see those lights all winter long, unfortunately. That's a it's so hard. Um, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I'm going to poke around into that, and who knows, maybe we'll start something here in New Hampshire. Here's a question from um, Raymond. He says, have there been any attempts to establish a national lighting standard through any congressional legislation? We had a hearing um, some time ago, and the legislator is no longer there. He was a uh, representative from Long Island. His son is an astronomer, so I think he probably talked his dad into uh, having a hearing. Israel uh, was his name. Um, but no, I, w the only national standards that we have are from this Illuminating Engineer Society. And they produce a series of booklets, recommendations, but <laughs> they're well funded by, as you can imagine, the lighting industry. So there's no reason to exceed these because we basically think that they're quite high, but we don't need to exceed these light levels. But occasionally they come out with um, dimming uh, recommendations, you know, when lights are not needed, they, they cut the, the uh, light level in half, should really just be shut off. But um, that's the only national standards that we have are, are set by that organization. Yeah, great question. Um, I guess we're beginning to wrap up. I, I'm not seeing any other questions. I do want to just um, put a, a little bee in anybody's bonnets around here. Um, 
if they want to do something. I don't know if people have noticed when they drive by the local schools at night, the schools are just lit up like you can't even believe. And so if anybody in their own community wants to kind of begin a conversation with um, the district that they live near or um, the school that they're with, that's a good place to start. And another spot is, um, I don't know, I'm looking at, I see Connie Gray, hi Connie. And I wonder about Rivermead, which is a retirement um, place. If you live in a retirement area, um, maybe looking at what, and I see Martha too, looking at your own community and seeing if you can put together a plan to help them reduce their light. You know what, I'll also send you a document about the school system that turns their lights off at night that saves money on the electricity, vandalism, break-ins, et cetera. So you could give that to your school because my school right behind me left their lights on all night. Now they shut them off. Love so, it. Great um, job. Yeah, that's a good situation. Yeah. And you know, also with these retirement homes, a lot of that lighting is going back into the bedrooms of the residents. Connie's so, nodding her head, yeah. They, they, you know, discuss with them possibly shielding those fixtures because it, it, it I'm telling you, light at night is, is class of, has been classified as a carcinogen. So I, it's very important that it not be intruding on our bedrooms. Great job. And also, you know, sleep in the dark. It's really important. Yeah. Love it. I can't wait to go to sleep tonight. Um, here's a, two last questions. Um, one, Ray, Raymond is curious about indoor lighting and what you can say about the GE Reveal light bulbs. Do you have any information on that? I don't know what that is. No, no. So maybe we'll have to do a little homework on that. Um, oh, Raymond, oh, do you oh, want to add anything? Pardon and me? Then, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I do a lot of reading. Uh, each day and I I just find that that's the most oh, gracious light for your eyes for re for reading we have no LEDs I know they're supposed to save a lot of money but we don't have any lights all our we have small lamps and they're all 40 watt GE reveals and uh, they're very they're very soft on your eyes if you do a lot of, of reading. Uh, do you know what the Kelvin is on the package i'd have to go look i i will look at it i saw your your recommendation i'll look at it yeah yeah check that out yeah, yeah. great yeah. thanks thanks raymond that's a great recommendation and here's one last just comment um about churches and their steeples we have a lot of new england churches and if you live near one you would also know that the the steeple is lit and it's lit so that it's lit right up into the sky so i i don't know that that might be a hard one to change, but this is a good place to start. Well, do they need it all night long? <laughs> good question. Will they need it all night long? I would say no, but I mean, who knows? Good, good point. And um, yeah, I just want to mention that um, as a kind of wrap, beginning to wrap things up. First, thank you so much, Susan. This was really fabulous. You are such a great advocate and so <laughs> well spoken. Let's give her an applause if you can or thumbs Thanks, up. Uh, but you know, can I say one more thing? Sure. You know, one of the ways that we've been able to bring the community on board with this dark sky um, effort is we host what we call star parties. And I'm sure you've got astronomers up there, and I'm sure you've got people with telescopes. You know, sometimes you could just take some of these people outside and show them the stars and let them know that, you know, this is a resource that we really need to protect. And it's not that hard. You know, um, that's the whole reason that, that, this, that the organization got going is because Tucson, where it was initiated, was surrounded with um, observatories. And they graduate, and the, the astronomers could see that they were losing their night sky and their professional, you know, observatories. It's also a big tourist, you know, attraction. So they went to Tucson, and and now and Tucson's had lighting laws for you know maybe thirty or forty years. That's so great. bring people's attention to the beauty of the night sky, and it'll help you in your effort. Uh, that's great. I'm looking over at my friend Victor over there, who's a phenomenal stargazer, and. This past winter, we were supposed to do a star watch together, but it was always cloudy. So Victor, maybe we've got some fall and 
fall programs in our future. Yeah, grab one of your local legislators. <laughs> I'm sorry, excuse me, that would be great. It's a wonderful way to introduce people to the night sky if they're not familiar with it. And I think it also will instill people uh, the appreciation of that dark sky as well. Yeah, that's great. I love the idea of a star party. Again, thank you so much, Susan. And for all of you, um, just a few little things to share with you. Tomorrow you will receive um, from Miles uh, with uh, an email with all the links to the um, things that Susan sent us, all the information plus a few more that she's going to send tonight or early tomorrow, so we can include them. And if you're really, if you're interested in seeing um, the slideshow over again, you can catch this on our YouTube channel where it will be posted. And Miles is nodding his head. Yes, Miles. About how long does it take for it to get up there? It'll probably be next week. So next week, and feel free to share it with other people. This was probably the um, program packed with the most information, incredible amount. Thank you again, Susan. That was fabulous. And thank all of you for being interested. Oh, look. Thank you, Susie. Okay. Thank you. Great. Ah, all right. My first Zoom meeting. <laughs> yeah, you did a great <laughs> job. <laughs> oh. <laughs> now go out and That's tonight wild. gaze up at the stars. So thanks, for, thank you everybody, and we'll call it a night. Bye bye. Bye. I'm not sure how. <laughs> well, Miles is gonna say goodbye to everybody. <laughs> I don't know how to get out. <laughs> We're keeping you forever, Susan. <laughs>